Is it true that not far from Jerusalem, in Israel, a cave where John the Baptist lived, has been found? The cave, a house, precisely the house of John the Baptist. What is it today, myth or reality? And crawled into the cave. It was covered with uh, undergrowth and... On one fine day, amazing things unfolded before our eyes. Of course, we immediately realized that we stumbled upon something very important. But the fact that the cave of John the Baptist was in front of us was discovered later. So, Vitaly, is it the cave of John the Baptist or something else? Will doubts always persist, and we will talk about it later in our program, and by definition, there will never be 100% evidence for any sensational finds. Yes, of course. There won't be? There won't be. Moreover, here's an interesting trend. A British archaeologist finds a cave with interesting drawings on the walls, with some sort of basin. But then it is said that the remains of a certain hermit were found there, of which there were many. And it is very interesting to establish the chronology. At the same time, it is forgotten for a moment that the remains have a head, but John the Baptist's head was supposedly cut off, and in a location much further east than the place that was discovered. Or does one sensation immediately give birth to a bunch of pseudo-sensations? The desire to have these sensations. The cave is indeed unusual. Yes, of course, the cave is indeed unusual. But still, yes, or no. Here you are, a traveler with a worldwide reputation. Yes, but I'm a researcher. Here, philosopher Sundakov finds this cave. Because the first thought that comes to mind is, John the Baptist, right? The unusual cave is hidden. It's like finding an alpenstock in Mexico. And then who? Trotsky, obviously. He was killed with this alpenstock, right? But we will never prove anything like this. There will be too much against it. In general, this is a very good conversation. Because history was traditionally studied by professional historians. But in the past, geologists, chemists, physicists, mathematicians, astronomers, and so on were never allowed in there. And conclusions in history were drawn by analogy. An ancient cup was found in Rome, put in a museum, here's a Roman cup. A similar one was found somewhere in Azov or Siberia, it looks like that one, therefore it's Roman. Okay, the Shroud of Turin. But it's been proven that this fabric simply couldn't have any relation to Christ based on its age alone. A difference of a thousand years, right? Is this proven? It's proven. Or could there have been a mistake too? But this proves that there is a real chronology and a fabricated one by Scaligerian chronologists, that a millennium was added to our world history. It didn't exist. So, Christ was born a thousand years later? A thousand years later, and science confirms this. History resists it. But hold on again. We don't know when Christ was born, even though the planet's calendar starts from the birth of Christ. We know, astrologers can confirm this if we rely on existing texts related to the movement of celestial bodies. So, Vitaly, as a scientist, do you believe that the Shroud of Turin is really the cloth in which the body of Christ was wrapped after the crucifixion? I believe so, provided that the real chronology prevails, not the Scaligerian one, then it all aligns. That it was all a thousand years later? Yes. And what evidence is there that Christ lived a thousand years later than is commonly believed today? I can provide a large number of examples. I'll give you the most important one. Let's start with such an example. There is a great mathematician and scientist Fomenko head of a department at Moscow State University. Our contemporary scientist. Our contemporary scientist, who, without any interest in history, began to recalculate Newton's formula related to the movement of the moon around the Earth. And suddenly he discovered that at some point, the moon made a thousand revolutions around the Earth in a second. That cannot be, it's clear. He says, wait, this cannot be because it can never be. So, Newton was wrong? Yes. Do academician Fomenko and you, claim that Christ lived a thousand years later than it is commonly believed on the entire planet? Even 1100 years later, the dating of the birth of Christ is a very important thing, and we have been working on it for a very long time. We started by restoring the old tradition of the 14th century, which claimed that he lived in the 11th century, a thousand years later, and just recently. Was such a concept already there? Such a concept already existed, it was forgotten and replaced by the modern one. But our latest work and careful calculations have shown that the correct dating is the 12th century of the common era, a thousand years later. How do you calculate it? Please explain. 
We simply found an old source from the 16th century, the Russian Pelea, in which the dating of the birth of Christ, baptism, and crucifixion is directly given. Who provided this dating? Pelea is a church book, like any church book. So, the author is unknown? No, it has no author, but it's a canonical church book. Where is it located? This book is located in the Rumyantsev collection of the State Library. It has a number, I don't remember it exactly now, I think it's 124. Let's say, the dating using the Star of Bethlehem. It is believed that it is known where, in which part of the sky, the remnants of the exploded star are located, which is considered to be the Star of 1054 and has long been identified with the Star of Bethlehem. Radiocarbon dating of the Shroud of Turin. Until recently, among scientists, naturalists in their majority, and also among the liberal intellectuals, there existed a point of view on the question of God's existence, which was best expressed, in my opinion, by Fazil Iskander. I don't know if God exists. There is no evidence of existence and no evidence of non-existence. Academician Fomenko and his co-author mathematician Nasovsky propose, as one can easily guess, a completely new view of world history, the history of our planet. So, let's listen to their arguments and evidence once again. So, according to your version, when did Christ live? He lived in the 12th century, born in 1152. Where? Most likely, in Constantinople, also known as Jerusalem, and was crucified there in 1185. Our study of history always proceeds in two stages. The first stage is precise dating of events. We guarantee them. Here we use methods of mathematics, statistics, astronomy. All our calculations can be accurately verified. We prove that our datings are correct. We prove that there is an interpretation of sources consistent with the new dates, and we present it. Did Christ really live for 33 years? Yes. How can this be established? This can be. As Kant famously had five proofs of God's existence, Dmitry Lihachov had his own, a sixth proof of God's existence. The four Gospels about one person, written by completely different people, different writers. But the image of the main character, Jesus Christ, remains the same in all four Gospels. This is evidence that it is a real personality. You see, today we easily deal with large numbers. We say it's the year 2004. But ancient people struggled to understand large numbers. Therefore, the ancient way of dating was the so-called solar cycle, lunar cycle from 1 to 19, and the indiction from 1 to 15. After we obtained the dating of the Star of Bethlehem in the 12th century AD through astronomical methods, the radiocarbon dating of the Shroud of Turin gave the same date. And in the Chronicles of the 12th century, there is the brightest duplicate of Gospel events. Just spitting image. When you start to put this together, you realize that the time discrepancy, to believe that it's not the year 2004 now, but 1004, is beyond my intellectual capacity. If we really subject certain historical events to research activity, then we will easily find out that, for example, all the megastructures, and I'm not talking about the Egyptian pyramids, are made of concrete. There were no millions of slaves allegedly hauling these blocks and so on. Just ordinary concrete. But isn't that easy to verify? Yes, easily. So, is it done? I, for example, went and checked. And what? Concrete. What? Real concrete? A documentary was made. A scientific article was written. Yes, concrete. What pyramids are those? Exactly. The main pyramids, Cheops Pyramid. So, everything around Cairo? Yes, they are made of concrete. This is the discovery of the French chemist, Joseph Davidovitz. By the way, a very significant discovery. Here are the Egyptian pyramids. And not only the pyramids, by the way, but also obelisks. Egyptian statues made of granite, of diorite, they are made of concrete. But if we talk about pyramids, it's very primitive concrete. But where did they get the concrete from? It's finely ground, dehydrated rock, which is poured with water. So, it's primitive concrete there? The pyramids are made of primitive concrete, at least inside the blocks. By the way, if you look at the small pyramids, the pyramid blocks there deteriorate like teeth. Why does a cavity form? Because there is a hard enamel and something softer inside. That's how pyramid blocks deteriorate. 
Look, how complicated everything is. For example, if we talk about Egypt. Egypt is a province of the empire, a royal burial necropolis. And they didn't bury rulers of Egypt there, but rulers of the entire empire. It's a royal necropolis. That is, Egypt was only involved in funerary affairs, as a province of this empire. There, they buried the kings of this empire. There are no hippodromes, temples for the nobility. There are only burial activities. In Egypt, you won't even find the word, pharaoh, neither on steles nor in papyri. Everywhere it's written, funeral. And when you ask, show me the word, pharaoh, he says, here it is. This means funeral. Well, P and H are pronounced as F. In what language? Well, that's what we agreed upon. Who agreed? If you look, the chronicles describe gospel events, and precisely in those datings that are obtained by independent methods. What chronicles are these? First of all, the chronicle of Nikita's Koniates. No one before understood, and we ourselves didn't understand that it describes gospel events. But when we purely formally calculated by dates that Christ was described in this chronicle, we were amazed. The gospel is described there in black and white. And besides, some places in the gospel, which were previously unclear to us and researchers, have now become clear. The idea that humanity, if conventionally counted from the birth of Christ, is not 2004 years old, but only 852 years, is, of course, a very unusual thought. But perhaps, gentlemen, all the imperfection of man with his ambitions, stupidity, greed, and so on and so forth. Maybe indeed, all the imperfections of people can primarily be explained by the fact that we, earthlings, have only been around for just under nine centuries. Please tell me, how is the calendar on earth conducted nowadays? Nowadays, it's done simply. 2004, how did it come about? From a certain point that was designated as the beginning of the era. And who and when was it designated? This point was designated in the 16th-18th centuries when certain erroneous calculations were made. Who did that? We cannot name the name, but most likely it was Scaliger. But we can specifically say what calculations were made and where exactly the mistake was made. And Scaliger, forgive my ignorance, is... Scaliger is a person who in science is considered the founder of scientific chronology. If you open textbooks on chronology, what was his nationality? It is believed that he was a French scholar. What century was it? The 16th century. Understandably, in the 16th century, during Scaliger's era, astronomy and mathematics, as well as the art of studying ancient texts, were not developed as they are today. After all, in the 16th century, practically one person, his school, the Scaliger School, established the dating on the planet. But one person, even founding his own scientific school, can always make mistakes. Man is human. In any case, now the book by Fomenko and Nisovsky, Tsar of the Slavs, is being studied by the entire scientific world. According to the concept of Fomenko in Nisovsky, the Shroud of Turin, that is, the cloth in which the body of Christ was wrapped, is authentic. In other words, gentlemen, this is the highest, now scientific evidence of the existence of God on earth. When that face suddenly appeared on the Shroud of Turin, there was a feeling that we already know this face. Am I right? We have seen it before. We explain this by the fact that icons were painted from the Shroud. But it had such a difficult history. It was lost, stolen somehow. The difficult history of the Shroud can be traced back to the 17th century, and in the 16th century, everything comes to a halt. Reliable history is traced back to the 17th century, from the moment when modern practice that has come down to us, appeared. It existed since the 17th century and brought us the correct understanding of history. The history of the 16th century is the very history that they wrote in the 17th century. It is significantly distorted, and as a result, we cannot reliably look back to the 16th century today. This is evident from the documents. There is Ivan the Terrible. Is that the 16th century? Yes, but where are the authentic documents from Ivan the Terrible? Here are authentic autographs of the Romanov Tsars. 
No questions asked. There are originals, there are many of them, and they are equipped with protection technique. Because a royal decree is not just a piece of paper, it could mean a lot. And it wasn't just written on paper. Starting from Mihail Romanov. Starting from Mihail Romanov, no questions asked. And what about Ivan the Terrible? Well, questions start arising. Boris Godunov, Vasily Shusky? Sure, they will show us decrees. For example, the original decree of Ivan the Third, just some text written on a piece of paper. Besides a pendant seal, there are no safety features there. But, excuse me, the pendant seal can be attached to anything, making a mold from any decree. Tell me, what do you think about the cave of John the Baptist found in Israel? As for the recent discovery of the cave of John the Baptist in Israel, the cave is huge. I think it's 20 by 10 meters. John the Baptist is depicted on the wall. Such a huge cave. You don't believe in this, do you? How do you imagine this? Christendom for 2,000 years. A cave. It is absolutely obvious, as they describe, that this is John the Baptist. It's just written on the wall. And for 2,000 years no one knew about this cave? And only now they found it. Can you believe in this? I can't. Why do we, and the whole world, study history by periods and by countries? Why not like this, evenly? Because it doesn't match up. If we take these periods and countries and start connecting them together, we see that neither the chronology nor the rulers match up. There are many phantom stories that have been transferred from one character to another. After the collapse of the empire, independent states were born. And each one needed a personalized and preferably ancient history, rooted in the distant past. Every historian commissioned to serve this political society wrote under a certain government contract. Dmitry Sergeyevich, is Eisenstein a great director? It's somehow commonly believed that a great artist, a truly great one, cannot lie. Oh, no. No? It's precisely the great ones who can lie the most. The film, Ivan the Terrible, is a very interesting film. If it weren't associated with a real figure, Ivan the Terrible, because it's all fabricated to fit its era. But, Battleship Potemkin is also fabricated. Of course. And, Alexander Nevsky, is also fabricated. Yes. By the way, yesterday on television they were broadcasting a show. They showed a sword with an inscription. Those who come to us sword in hand, something like, will be gone with the sword we'll or, die. will die by the sword. And this was said by Alexander Nevsky. This was broadcast several times on television. Alexander Nevsky never said this phrase in his life. This was invented by academician Pankaratova. When she was writing about Alexander Nevsky, and she was a very bad historian, she put these words in his mouth. So, everywhere is questionable when it comes to today's accepted history. Because even today, if you go to the Cairo Museum and say, wait, what is this? This is a steel knife that belonged to Pharaoh Tutankhamun. You say, wait, something's wrong with my head, isn't it? Ancient Egyptians didn't have metal. Where did a steel knife on a pharaoh come from? Well, obviously, it's meteoric iron. You say, excuse me, how was it processed? He says, why are you asking all these questions? Stop it. You say to him, and what is this? This is the pharaoh's clothing. Made of what? Linen and cotton. Wait, where did linen and cotton come from? Probably, specially trained people brought them from somewhere. And this? And these are cornflower wreaths that were on the pharaoh's forehead. Wait, where did cornflowers come from? You ask for a pathology report on the best preserved mummy. Let's say, Ramesses II. You are told, height 2 meters, facial features are European, skin color is white, straw-colored hair. One hack of Ramesses II. Plain and simple, Andre, I have tons of artifacts. So, Ramesses II is Slav, isn't he? I didn't understand. Well, at least he's not Egyptian, not Arab, that's for sure.